grace and peace to each one of you. And greetings to each one of you from our Lord Jesus Christ. That name, that wonderful name, the sweetest name that sinners on this side of heaven can hear is a name that we love to uphold, we love to talk about. For the name Jesus is very special. Matthew 1, 21, Thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. And it's sin that separates us from God. And we all need the Savior. We realize what part of the world we come from. We need the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the Voice of Truth program coming your way, and I am your host, Paul Fry. I'd like to ask you a personal question. How would you describe the spiritual state of your church that you attend, if you attend any? And you might say, well, that's none of your business. Well, no, it's not my business, but it's the king's business because the Lord Jesus Christ uh, made that very clear that he is concerned about the spiritual health of each church. And uh, it was displayed <coughs> or recorded in Revelation chapter 2 and 3 when he walked among the churches and evaluated them. And as we think of our own church and its spiritual state, we also have to ask, since we're part of the church, we have to ask, what is my spiritual state? But let's look at the churches that our Lord evaluated in the book of Revelation. <clears throat> the first one was Ephesus. He said good things about them, but then he had a reprimand. They had left their first love, and he said, repent, or I'll remove your candlestick. Then there was a church at um, Pergamos. He had good things to say about them too, but they were careless, spiritually careless, and they left uh, false doctrine come in to the church, which was affecting their vitality. And then <clears throat> uh, there was uh, another church, the church at Thyatira. What was going on there? They began to imitate the world's customs and standards and in other words, the world was infecting that church, and he was very harsh about them, but he had some good things to say about them. Then there was the church at Laodicea. He didn't say, have any good thing to say about them. He said, you're lukewarm, and because you're lukewarm, I'll spew you out of my mouth. But there's another church I want to talk about today. It's the church at Sardis. And let me read what he says. The, this church at Sardis was <clears throat> erected in a city that had known great wealth, but also had known great wars. And in the first century, a great earthquake. So great was the earthquake that the emperor at that time, Tiberius, had rescinded uh, their taxes for five years. But it was <clears throat> in that city that uh, some believe the Apostle John had started a church. And it lasted for probably around two centuries and nothing was heard of it. But listen to this evaluation that was given to the Apostle John on the Isle of Patmos. Let me read from John chapter 3, verses 1 to 6, about the church of Sardis. And unto the angel of the church in Sardis write, These things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know thy works. Thou hast a name that thou livest and art dead. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. For I have not found thy works perfect before God. Remember therefore how thou hast received and heard and hold fast and repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch I will come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. Thou hast a few names, even in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He that overcometh, the same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot, blot out his name out of the book of life. But I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. 
there's not any good thing he had to say about the church of Sardis except that they had a name that they were alive but he said you're dead and <clears throat> I'd like to talk about how the king reveals himself to this church I'd like to talk about his evaluation I'd like to talk about his exhortation to the church how he reminds the church of the grace that he had bestowed upon them and then there were a few there that he gave a commendation to and then sober instruction this is what we want to talk about the dead church that is the title of our message today the dead church <clears throat> when it says that they had a name it simply means that they had a reputation you know a reputation as somebody said is what people think you are but character is what God knows that you are that's a big difference it's easy to impress the society or <coughs> uh, man by religious activity but God knows whether you have the kernel or just the husk and he knows whether you have uh, profession and possession or just profession someone has said that character without religion without Christ is like a body without a spirit for we know that the body without the spirit is dead and the soul without the spirit of the living Christ is spiritually dead also that's why Jesus said you must be born again he says they're dead and then again <clears throat> Um, the church at one time no doubt had uh, flourished in a very wonderfully spiritual way many many lives were changed many lives were saved but they evidently got careless and in their carelessness they began to diminish in their spiritual fervor and <clears throat> They became like Samson, Judges 1620, after his strength was removed because his hair was cut. He did not know that his strength had left him. He did not know that the spirit had left him. And it would seem that this is what is happening here. The church did not know that the spirit of God had withdrawn from them as a church body. Now there were still some faithful ones there. And then again in Matthew uh, 23, 5, they were like the Pharisees. All the, all the works that the Pharisees did was to be seen of men. It was almost seen that the church here at Sardis had fallen so low that they desired the honor of men rather than the honor of God. And then again, <clears throat> evidently, and it's what churches are doing today, they're drawing men to themselves, especially pastors fall into that pit where they draw their congregation to themselves instead of to Christ. And if a preacher is not drawing the flock to Jesus Christ, or others that come in to hear the gospel, then he has a lot to answer for on that day of accounting. Our purpose as a church, our purpose as a pastor, is to draw people to Jesus Christ and not to ourselves. In the days of our Lord's humanity, he did not receive honor from man. He didn't want it. He only cared about pleasing the Father. <clears throat> and then, this indictment, he said, you're dead. Well, when you're spiritually dead, you're alienated from the life of God. Ephesians 4.18, the understanding is darkened because of their ignorance they're blinded by the God of this age and then again Matthew 23 27 and 28 listen to these words this is what the Lord described in the days of his humanity the religious people of his day he said they were like whited sepulchers beautiful on the outside but unclean and dead on the inside they appeared righteous unto men but inside they were full of hypocrisy and iniquity now, how far the church at Sardis had fallen into that kind of description, I do not know, but he said you're dead. Now, Trina, I asked you the question, what is the spiritual state of your church? And personally, what is your own spiritual state? 
It's so easy to wear religious clothing. It's so easy to speak religious talk. It's so easy to be involved in religious activity. But is the life of Christ coming out of you? Is it coming out of the church? Again, <clears throat> someone has said in the spiritual uh, sense, the shadow of death and death itself works silently by degrees within a congregation. Now, I'd like to refer to those four other churches that I mentioned. Notice how it starts. And I believe these churches are representative of the church in every age. Some people believe that these churches are, rep are, are represented in the historical sense of the church history, but I rather believe that they're representative of the churches in any age. But the first church lost its first love. Then, when you lose your first love, there's always the inroads of wrong doctrine. And then there, after wrong doctrine, then there is that beginning to imitate the world. We feel comfortable with the world's fashions and with the world's standards. And then after that, lukewarm. But I've noted down uh, nine different things that I'd like to just have you think about regarding the church at Sardis, which the Lord Jesus evaluated as dead. Even though they had a name to the community, he said that they were dead. As we already mentioned, number one, they had left their first love. And number two, when you lose your first love, then you begin to be careless about your personal devotions. And if you want to stay spiritually healthy, if you know the Lord, then you need to have personal devotions, either by yourself or with your family, if you have a family. Thirdly, you need, <clears throat> after there is a departure from uh, <clears throat> the personal devotions, then there is a departure from regularity to the worship services. Sunday morning, Sunday evening, during the week, there's a departure uh, from that regularity. Then fourthly, then what happens? Then a heart begins to magnify the temporal and the eternal begins to diminish. I tell you, I don't know of any greater delight than to think about our eternal home, eternal glory, to be with the Lord, the only man. He is the God-man, but in the days of his humanity, we could say that he is the only man that ever really loved you. And to be with him forever. That's the reason Colossians 3, 1 to 4, it says, Set your affection on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God the Father. In other words, let your heart be where your home is, if indeed you've been born of the Spirit of God. And if you haven't been, then you need to flee to the Savior for your eternal refuge, for salvation. The only way you can flee to Him is with your sins and leave Him at the cross, forsake them, and pray to Him for mercy, for salvation, that He will accept you. See, we talk about accepting Christ, but we need to come to Him that He will accept us. And He'll accept any sinner that comes to Him in true repentance, in true humbleness of spirit, in the surrender of the mind, the will, and the heart to His Lordship. He will accept any sinner and give them the joy of salvation and quicken him by his spirit. And then, <clears throat> not only, in fact, um, Paul warns of this to uh, Timothy in 1 Timothy 5, 6, we read these words, But she that liveth in pleasure is dead while she liveth. And that was the church at Sardis. Then, number five, it affects the times we do go to worship. The only kind of worship we want to be a part of is that which affects our senses. We call it sensual worship. In other words, there must be something external to motivate us into the spirit of worship. The Lord don't want that. He won't accept that. The only kind of worship that the Lord will accept is spiritual worship. He said, the Father seeks those who will worship Him in spirit and in truth. Nothing external. That He alone is motivation for worship to come out the overflow of a grateful heart that has known saving grace, redeeming grace through the Lord Jesus Christ. And not only uh, does essential replace the spiritual in worship, 
but then there is no law, love for lost souls. That's certainly one of the number one things that you see in a dead church. They have lost their love for the perishing. I read recently of um, someone who had written about a cartoon that they had uh, gleaned along the way. It uh, showed <clears throat> the outside of a church and the adversaries against the church. At that time there was communism, then atheism, no unbelief, and then materialism, all these things trying to <clears throat> batten down the purpose of the church. Then inside there was something very sad. There was the offering box for missions and over it had grown cobwebs and at the bottom of the caption it said how to kill a church. If you want to know how to kill a church just lose your passion for the lost and perishing. And then also when a church is dead it loses its holy, it departs from holy reverence, the holy reverence of God. And I have been in enough churches to see that that holy reverence for God, the sense of His presence there as the people gathered to worship, has certainly become so real. Like in the days of Isaiah, let me read from Isaiah 29, 13, Wherefore the Lord saith, For as much as this people draw near me with their mouth and with their lips, and they do honor me and have removed uh, they honor me with their mouth and their lips, but they have removed their heart far from me, and their fear toward me is taught by the precepts of man. Instead of it being regulated by how God reveals himself in the Holy Scriptures, man teaches his own ideas about worship not regulated by God's instruction and about coming to him and about honoring him in the daily life. It's taught by man's precepts instead of the scriptures. And whenever that's done, you know the church is very dead. And there's something else that happens in a dead church like Sardis. It loses its hatred of evil. Let me read from Proverbs 8.13. The fear of the Lord, and then Psalm 97.10. The love, uh, if you love the Lord, is to hate pride, arrogance, and the evil way, and the perverse mouth do I hate. What is that? Saying things that you don't really mean. Giving religious talk that's really not in your heart, but just to impress others. That is sure deadness. And then there's another indication of a dead church like Sardis. There is no opposition, no persecution. You know, as I speak to you today, <clears throat> from the last uh, reading that I've had, there's at least 38 countries where people that name the name of Christ suffer persecution for his name's sake. And as someone said, the reason Satan doesn't bother a dead church is like in warfare. Uh, as soldiers <clears throat> fighting the enemy will not fire bullets into dead bodies. And so therefore, uh, why does Satan have to worry about a dead church? He's no, the dead church is no threat to his kingdom of darkness. These are illustrations that picture the spiritual state of the church. And again, I'm going to ask you, what is the spiritual state of your church? Do any of these things that I have shared, are they descriptive in any way? I read recently of a pastor, he was, his heart was broken um, because he saw the church just <clears throat> drying, dying, dying. And one time he told the congregation, he said, this church is dead. And he said, <clears throat> next Lord's Day I'm going to preach a funeral sermon. And so he did that. He had a casket, a real casket up front uh, before the um, um, pulpit. At the end of the service, he said, now, he said, I know some of you <clears throat> um, probably don't believe what I said, but he said, I want you to come up and, and view the remains. And so the casket was open, and the people came up and began to file past, and when they looked down in, they looked, were looking into a mirror. They saw the reflection of their own faces, and they got the message. Although they were going through religious activities, and as long, they were attending church services. But as far as spiritual life 
as far as making a difference in the community, they had lost it. They had no desire. They really were acting like those that had never had spiritual life. And uh, as we go on here, it says now there is a warning because there's a few there that were not touched by the deadness around them. In verse 2, he says, Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die, for I have not found thy works perfect before God. That word, to be watchful, it means to be spiritually alert, be sober, be vigilant, for your adversary, the devil, walketh about seeking whom he may destroy. <clears throat> The enemy, there's no time out for the enemy. He's always plotting destruction. And when we get spiritually careless and fall asleep, so to speak, and become dead like the church at Sardis, we're no threat to the enemy. But he says, be, he says, be watchful. Watch out for your, the welfare of your own soul. Watch out for the eternal welfare of others. And I'll tell you, there's no way that you'll just slumber along going through the motions when you realize the eternality and the profound importance of eternity, of heaven, and of hell. So he said, be watchful and strengthen the things which are about to die. In other words, it had gotten so low there are just a few remaining. And so I believe he's addressing those that are still alive. It says in Ephesians 6, 10, 11, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. If you indeed have been born of the Spirit of God, then you know something about spiritual warfare. And uh, there is that <clears throat> exhortation of the king. He says, be watchful, be alert. He said, your works are not acceptable for God. They're done in the energy of the flesh. I want to see them done in the energy of the spirit. That's the only kind of work I can accept. Verse 3, Remember therefore how thou hast received and heard and hold fast and repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. And here we have a reminder of the king, of his grace, and that they had been given the faith to believe. His grace, <clears throat> not only that they have had the faith to believe, but that they had the spirit repentance to come to him for salvation. He's reminding them of his grace upon them. Saved by grace, not of works. It's a gift of God, not of uh, works, lest any man should both. Saved by grace through faith. And he reminds them. And then he commends. Uh, and he also, I believe, is warning them that he remove whatever false security they might have had in their religious activity as a dead church. And then he commends in verse 4, Thou hast a few names, even in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments. In other words, though they were in the midst <clears throat> of uh, death, so to speak, and by the way, in the ceremonial law, in the Old Testament church, if anyone uh, touched a dead person, they were defiled. But here they were in the midst of spiritual death and they were not defiled. They kept their character. They kept their life. And that's what the Lord is looking for. Those who will stand up for Jesus. Those who will not go with the flow. Those who will stand alone for Jesus. Those are those who are spiritual life. Those who are not ashamed of the gospel of the grace of God. Those who will testify of the gospel of the grace of God. That's where these were that were spiritually alive. And he's encouraging them. He's, he's speaking about <clears throat> letting not let their garments, in other words, the putting on the new man, not the old man that was <clears throat> done away with <clears throat> or removed from the throne when uh, uh, they were saved, when the Holy Spirit took uh, over the throne of the sanctuary of their hearts, to put on the new man, gentleness, kindness, humility of mind, these things that under the Lord, he says, that's the kind of clothing he says, I want you to wear. He's speaking in a figurative sense now. He said, he that overcometh, he said, shall be clothed in white raiment. That's righteousness, his righteousness. I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. When we're saved, we walk by faith. And we overcome the adversary, the devil. We overcome the world. And we overcome the flesh by faith. The just shall live by faith. And so we hear again <clears throat> that he that have an ear, he says, Listen to what is being said. 
And that's my challenge to each one of you. What is, a spiritual, what is your spiritual state? What is the spiritual state of your church? You're either spiritually alive or you're spiritually dead. And this is an exhortation and a, a humble pleading. Recognize your spiritual state. And if anything that has been said today describes your spiritual state, discard it. Flee to the Savior. If you're unsaved, He will receive you when you come in repentance and faith. And if you are saved, let Him renew, fan the flame again of the fire of your soul into real life work for Jesus to bring honor and glory to God. My dear ones, over the gate of Glasgow, there was this uh, rendering. It was saying, <coughs> It says, preach the gospel. For when the preach the gospel, then the people will flourish spiritually. Have an art heart for the gospel, dear ones. Receive the gospel. Live by the gospel. And be in surrender to the King, the Lord Jesus Christ. And you'll be very much spiritually alive as His Holy Spirit guides, directs, and yes, brings conviction upon you. Thank you for this time with you today. You can call the telephone number. You can write to the post office box for free literature, for <clears throat> uh, tapes of our messages, or you can call for counseling for prayer. God bless you till we meet again. My gracious Redeemer, my Savior, art thou, if ever I love thee. Jesus, tis now. I love thee because thou hast first loved me and purchased my pardon on Calvary's tree.